Again, we bow before you. Lord, we ask for your help as we uh, see the Apostle Paul back some 2,000 years ago uh, giving a defense for his faith, making this powerful confession. And we'll thank you as we explore that and learn from it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we live in a world where truth is so relative and to confess that we know truth sounds pretty arrogant in the world that we live in. Uh, people will think that you think too highly of yourself if you declare that you know what is true. But what we find here is the Apostle Paul making a powerful confession. Uh, he, if you remember the story, uh, he was accused by those Judaizers and, and there in Jerusalem, uh, he had to stand before uh, the government there and before the Sanhedrin and, and then they had this plot against him when he was put into prison and uh, remember that there were all these men, of the 40 men that were, had pledged and made an oath to kill him. And, uh, but his nephew came and, and uh, told him and he told the, the commander there in the prison and they arranged for him to have this escort to Caesarea. And so he's now in Caesarea before the governor Felix. And uh, after it says, after the, the rest of the Jews came and the governor was going to hear uh, this case that uh, we find him now having to defend himself before the governor Felix. And, and so in front of Felix, he makes this powerful confession. And I want you to, to, let's break down this confession and what he says and understand how it can speak to us in our lives and what our confession needs to be as well. And I'm going to ask if they would in the back, if you can move for me um, to the next slide there. Uh, because he said in the, the, his first confession that uh, he worshipped God. That he worshipped God. Look at verse 14. After uh, he was accused of being a plague and creating dissension among the Jews, uh, the, after these accusations were laid out in the early part of the chapter, in verse 5 and 6, he was accused of being a ringleader of this section of the Nazarenes that was referred to as the way. Uh, he was accused of profaning the temple in verse 6. All these accusations were made against Paul. Paul finally starts to refute the accusations and give his defense starting in verse 10. And he said that he could not have been a ringleader in any sect in Jerusalem because he had only been there for 12 days. Now you have to go back and try and do the math. But uh, remember, he came in, he was in this hurry to get to Jerusalem. He came into Jerusalem and he spent some time, first of all, with the other apostles and elders there uh, in Jerusalem. And, and, and half the 12 days, half of that time was spent with James and with the other apostles as he told them all the things that God had done while he was on his missionary journey. Time was also spent with those other disciples and if you go back to verses 20, I mean chapter 21 verses 18 and 19, you find there some of the things and the witnesses that could give witness to the fact that, that Paul was with them for a number of days. Then there were witnesses that he had gone through the process of purification. One of the accusations against him was that uh, he was defiling the temple. But, but he says that there are witnesses that had witnessed the fact that he went through the process of purification before entering the temple. And so Paul, point by point, refuted the accusations that were made against him. Point by point, he defended himself and showed and demonstrated how that could not be possible. And Paul could have left well enough alone right there. 
Paul could have stopped right there and said to himself, now I have defended myself against these accusations. I have proven my innocence. He could have stopped right there and, uh, and rested his case. You know how the defense goes after they make their arguments, they rest their case. Uh, but instead of resting his case, Paul was not the kind of Christian like many of us that would leave an opportunity to witness for God on the table. If it was you and I, we probably would have rested our case. I made my point. I'm out of here. Paul was not that kind of Christian who would, who would not take advantage of an opportunity to witness for his Lord. And you know, if you stop and think about it, how many times have you and I missed opportunities to share the gospel? Let's be honest now. You know, you're standing in line at the supermarket and the Spirit of God speaks to you. You know, you should at least hand a little yellow card to this person in front of you. You should say something about Jesus, how good he's been. But nah, maybe next time. And we let the opportunity go. Paul was not that kind of Christian. He didn't leave opportunities on the table. And he states very clearly here where he stood. His first confession is given. He said he worshiped God according to the gospel of the way. And while he never stirred up any movement in Jerusalem, he clearly stood with Jesus. He wasn't denying the fact that he was on the side of Jesus Christ. While he said that he wasn't going to stir up anything, he wasn't a ringleader to any movement, he wasn't causing any sedition, uh, he wasn't standing against the Roman Empire, that was not his agenda. His agenda was to promote the kingdom of God and he was going to stand and say, I'm on the side of Jesus. You know, this confession was certainly not in the best interest of his case before Felix. Uh, there's no way in the world that uh, he should have upset the governor uh, by bringing in uh, all of these other extraneous things like the God that he worshipped and the fact that, that you needed to recognize who God was. You see, to worship God means to assign to him supreme value and worth. Now, let me make sure that we're clear on this because worship is not the few songs that we sing at the start of the service. Let's be clear. Worship is not, you know, what we stand and we raise our hands and praise the Lord. That's not, that might be a small slice of worship. Worship is when you value God above everything else, so much so that it in, impacts the decisions that you make Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Worship is, it infects how we spend our time and money. It says that I value God above everything else and so my money and my time and my energy is going to go toward him first and foremost. You see, you can, there are a lot of Christians that can sing the songs. We don't even need the words on the screen after a while. And, and, but that's just where it starts. Worship has to penetrate every area of our lives. Worship needs to invade our priorities. Worship needs to affect the decisions that we make. It needs to enter into every area. And Paul here in his first confession says, I worship God. I value him. And not just in any old vague way, but according to the way, which was a reference to, you know, they didn't have the word Christian back then, but it was a reference to the way that, uh, that Jesus prescribed. And so he worshiped God according to Jesus Christ. And so it's not about the, the songs that we sing here in church, at least not much of it is about that. 
And so how many of us can confess like Paul that we worship the God of the Bible? How many of us can confess like Paul that we worship Jesus Christ, that we value him, that he is first and foremost? You know, I like to draw that, that pyramid uh, because all of us, we operate at the bottom of the pyramid, but we need to put God at the top of the pyramid. He needs to be in first place in our lives, and that is worship. So tell somebody, I confess, I worship God. And not just in some superstitious way, but in a way that's going to affect every area of our lives. But then at the end of verse 14, we, we find something else. Uh, let me just read that verse. He says, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And so he confesses that he believes the Bible. He believes the scriptures. He believes all things that were written in the scriptures. Now, to be clear, this was aimed at creating a point of commonality with the other Jews that were accusing him. Because they too believed the Old Testament Bible. They too believed the scriptures. Uh, the, the Jews, even today, they believe the Bible. They believe the scriptures. And so what Paul was doing was he wanted to start where they were and build from there. And he says, I too believe the Bible. I too believe the prophets. I too believe what was written there in the scriptures. And that's one of the things that we can learn from the ministry of Jesus is that it's always good in our witness to start where there's common ground. You know, when you read the stories of Jesus and how he ministered, uh, he would always start where people were. Uh, if people were... Uh, fishermen, he would start talking about fish. If people were needing healing, he would approach them on the basis of, of healing. He would always start where there was common ground. And I want to suggest to you that that's a lesson that you and I need to learn, that as we share with people, as we witness with people, it's always good to start where there's common ground. Now, unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, there's not a whole lot of common ground, especially, especially around the Bible. You know, it used to be that you could take it for granted everybody believed the Bible, right? Even if they didn't know what was in it, they, they believed that it was true. But today, there's not a whole lot of common ground even when we talk about the Bible. Uh, I was in, in Trinidad a few weeks ago and we were doing some, you know, just sharing our faith with different people. And we did it by starting, uh, we were asking a little survey question, you know, that um, on a scale of one to 10, how sure are you that when you die, you're gonna go to heaven? We got all kinds of answers, everything from 10 to one. And, uh, but I remember a young man, he was about 20 years old and, and he came out with an answer. He said, oh, about a seven. So I asked him, I said, well, you know, what gives you that level of confidence that you're gonna go to heaven? And they started talking about his grandmother that prayed for him and his grandfather was a pastor and what church he went to. And, all, you know, you hear all the, the stuff that people are relying on. And, uh, and I was able to, to take him from that point of where he was now being concerned about, you know, being sure because at least he had some common faith in the Bible that, uh, that it was an easy jump for him to, to make it. Uh, but so rare that is, especially here in America. Uh, people are, are so, you know, taken up by all the different books that are out there and the different religions that are out there and how do you know your denomination is right and how do you know the next church is, is wrong and, and all that stuff. That, that people throw out at you. And the, the bottom line is that, that we need to find a way that we can join right where they are and bring them to Jesus. 
Bring them to Jesus. And that's what Jesus did. I think that's the example that he leaves for us today. Uh, and, and you know, when you talk about the Bible, it only takes a surface examination of the Bible against every other religious book that's out there to see right away the difference. Has anybody here ever read the Koran? Anybody? You got one? If you ever want to read the Koran, I have one. I have a copy in my office. And, um, but it doesn't take long as you read through to see the difference just in the quality of the writing between the Bible and the Koran. Forget everything else. But, but then if you take one step further, and you, and you know, it doesn't take long to understand that, that one man got a vision from God and came back and said that this is the revelation that I got. As opposed to the Bible written by 40 different men over 1,500 years, men that never met each other, men that never had the opportunity to collaborate, and, and they wrote about something like theology, and they're all on the same page. To me, that's a miracle. That separates the Bible from every other religious book that's out there. Not to mention the fact that you can go to this person's grave site and you can go to the other person's grave site and uh, all these religious leaders grave sites but when you go to Jerusalem and you go to the grave site of Jesus guess what it's empty he's not there as angel said he's risen and, uh, and so there, is, uh, there are huge differences between uh, the Bible and all these other religions. And, and we need to understand that so that while we start where people are, we can take them to a place that no other religion offers. Every other religion out there is about how man can reach God and what you have to do to reach God. And how many prayers a day you need to satisfy God. And the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only one that says you can't do anything to reach God. That God has done it all. That he paid the price. That he came down to man to restore us. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, that should get all of us excited like we got Paul excited to take people from where they are and bring them to Jesus. Amen? And so uh, Paul had this great confession when it came to the Bible. Somebody needs to say, I confess. I confess. The Bible. And, uh, and that needs to be our confession and our faith. That needs to be what we build our faith on. But look at the next verse in verse 15. Verse 15 says, I have hope in God. I have hope in God. You see, uh, Paul confessed hope in God and his promise of resurrection. Paul was clear about where his hope rested. His hope rested completely in God and in the promise of the resurrection. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the summary of the events of the gospel story. How Jesus came down from heaven. How he was crucified and buried and rose again on the third day and ascended back to the Father. Uh, th those facts of the gospel story. Uh, that, that without the resurrection, our faith is futile. And that we are, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15 without the resurrection we are as most men more than than other men most futile and uh, and pitiable uh, so in in verse 20 Paul declares that he has confidence that Christ is risen and has become the first fruits of our resurrection that's in 1 Corinthians 15 and so his faith was firmly rooted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I just want to encourage you today that you too can have your confession and your faith 
firmly rooted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That, uh, that hope that we have in Christ. Um, you know, we, we are, are, should not be people that are in despair. We should not be people that uh, are throwing up our hands. We should not be the people who are, who are you know, succumb to all kinds of uh, false teaching and, and find ourselves wandering around and not knowing what to believe. We need to have a firm hope in Jesus. You know, when we were talking in the 101 class today about the fact that, that uh, we place our faith in the love of God that nothing will ever separate us from. What does Romans 8 say? Not death, nor life, nor principalities, nor power, nor anything created, Nothing in the past, nothing in the present, nor things to come in the future. Nothing can mess up this wonderful salvation that God has given us. That's a hope that we can stand in. That's a hope that we can trust in. And, and you know, it's a relationship that we have as we are born into the family of God. I am now a child of God. And nothing can mess that up. And so I, uh, you know, it's not arrogant for me to say when I die, I'm going to heaven. It's not pompous for me to stick my chest out and say Jesus loves me. Because he loves you. And he loves all of his children as we come into that relationship with him. He has that special love for us. And so nothing can separate us from that. And we, it creates a wonderful hope that we have. And so uh, I, I spoke to Christine uh, Maddox. I don't see them here today. But um, I was talking to her the other day and um, she, she was at a funeral service. And she said, it just struck me at this funeral service that they were singing that song, um, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, right? And she got the impression like it was like these people, that please pass me not, O Gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, and they're pleading with God. So she wanted to try and reconcile that with the the hope that we should have in Christ. So, um, so we started talking about the contrast between that song and blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Now that doesn't mean that, that uh, there aren't times in our lives when we find ourselves pleading to God and saying, Lord, pass me not. I think if you feel that way, it's legitimate to express that to God. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to cry down one song over another. I think it expresses two different, you know, points in somebody's life. But if you're going to side on one side or the other, let's side on the side of blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And no matter what storm you might be going through, no matter what issue you might be facing, even in, the, in facing death itself, we can have that blessed hope, that blessed assurance that God loves us and nothing is going to separate us from his love. Amen? Amen. Somebody say, I confess, I confess. my hope is in God. It's not in what I can do. It's not in what, uh, how righteous I am. It's, my hope is not about how good I am or if I, you know, better than the next person or anything like that. My hope is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at verse 16. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. So Paul confessed to, have a, to having a conscience 
without any offense toward God and other men. Paul's aim was to have this clear conscience. Unfortunately, many of us only grieve the Holy Spirit and, and we constantly offend people around us. So the opposite of Paul's conscience, where his conscience is clear with God and clear with fellow men, uh, some of us, we are constantly offending others and being offended by others and we're constantly grieving God. Now, you know, uh, I think that uh, that should be a challenge to all of us. And the fact is that, that we have become good at shaming. James Twitchell, the author of the book For Shame, says that increasingly we can't find satisfaction in our judicial system when people offend us or we offend other people. And so shaming people has become the option of choice. Now what does that mean? You know, the, we live in a day and age where everything is captured on video now, right? And uh, if you step on somebody's foot, it'll show up on Facebook. Right? Um, and, and so, rather than, than working it out, rather than having a conversation, rather than, you know, apologizing and coming to terms, we'll just post it and make it the, the worst possible, you know, picture that we can get and shame people. Um, you know, I like, one of the things I like about Malcolm Jenkins, who's a, a Philadelphia Eagle, is that he spends a lot of time having conversations with police um, departments, conversations with schools and, and uh, people in authority, having the discussion that, that we need to have in order for us to arrive at a more just society. Now, you know, he's not, he's not kneeling, he's not doing anything that others might do, but he's quietly working on behalf of justice. Uh, draw the, the other side of the equation where I don't even want to talk to you, I don't want to have that discussion, I'm just going to post it and uh, put somebody in a bad light. And especially in the church of Jesus Christ, among brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, you're not hearing me. We need to not be trying to shame people and especially shame each other. Our confession needs to be that we want to not have any offense between us. That whatever issues exist, whatever, whatever circumstances might be there, somebody stepped on my foot, brother, let's talk about it. Let's work it out. And we need to work it out and have that conversation and not fall into a shaming. We need to be able to stand with the Apostle Paul and say that my conscience is clear that to the best of my ability, I'm not offending anybody else and it's hard to offend me. You know, I'm not going to get bent out of shape because you step on my toe. I'll just tell you, don't do it again. But, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, we need to be hard to offend and easy to, to be able to go and make sure that we straighten out when we offend other people. And uh, that's where Paul was, and that's where we need to be. Strive to, to, to love each other. Strive to have open communication with each other. Strive to care about each other as a family of God. Strive to be able to stand before God and stand before people that, and with a clear conscience say that, that we love and not offend. And so say, I confess to strive to never offend. Boy, y'all making some powerful confessions today. If you could live them out, it would be great. And then lastly, one last one, in verse 25. Verse 25 says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. 
When I have convenient time, I will call for you. You see, Paul confessed that there was a day of judgment to come. Paul confessed that, uh, that there is an issue of righteousness that all of us have to deal with. And how many of you know that to preach judgment is never a popular thing? If you think that hellfire and brimstone preaching is not popular today, well, guess what? It wasn't popular back then either. It's never been a popular thing. But, but you know what? One of the things I declared a long time ago is that preaching is not a popularity contest. Amen. If you're preaching to satisfy man, then you're, you got your preaching bent out of shape. I like what uh, Carson Wentz says, you know, audience of one. I'm preaching to satisfy one person. I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, and so, the, you know, preaching this hellfire and judgment was not a popular thing. Paul was also taking a huge risk to talk about righteousness and sin and personal responsibility and judgment in front of the governor. This was a man who could throw the hammer down on him. And Paul is talking to him about, about sin and righteousness. If ever there was a time to soften your tone, to equivocate on your doctrine, if there was ever a time to plain shut up and know when to sit down, this was the time. But Paul was not that kind of preacher. Paul was not that kind of person. He would be the kind to hit the streets of Lansdale with or without a bottle of water to give out. And let people know that there is a day coming when we will have to give an account. Somebody needs to say amen. You see, my Bible tells me that Jesus is coming back. My Bible tells me that it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. My Bible tells me that one way or the other, either through the rapture when he comes back or through death, that all of us are going to have to stand before God one day. And so there can be no greater priority for believers but to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That he loves us, that he cares about us, that he laid down his life and shed his precious blood for us. My confession then has to become more than words. It has to become the principle that drives my life. It needs to become the motivation. If I say that I love my family, if I say that I love my friends, if I say that I love those people around me, I need to be willing to share with them the love of God, understanding that Jesus is the only hope that they have to make it into eternity. And for, for too many of us, who have, I'm not going to have you raise your hands, don't get scared. But there are way too many of us that have never shared the gospel and led someone else to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, it got quiet now. But that, that needs to be a driving force in our lives. That, that needs to be a motivation. That, that needs to be something that we confess. This is what my life is for. He didn't leave us down here just to twiddle our thumbs. If it was just about you going to heaven, you, he should take you home as soon as you accept him. He leaves us down here because he has a mission for us. He has a job for us to do. And a big part of that job is to share with men and women around that God loves them, that he cares about them, that he laid down his life to die for them. And that they don't have to be afraid of that day of judgment as it comes. And so let's make our confession as Paul made his confession. To, to become a principle that drives our lives, that we are going to
tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ and the judgment to come. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Now I heard you make some confessions verbally. But I wonder how many of us can ask God in prayer to really help us to be who he has called us to be. To worship God. Make him a priority in our lives. Do you ask God to help you? To stand on the word of God. To make that our manual for living. And whether you like it or not, whatever the Bible says, that's what we need to follow. Has God to help you to, to love others and not be a source of offense and certainly not to be the source of trying to shame other people. And then lastly, ask God to help you to be a witness, to share the good news. And as you make those commitments and ask God for his help, I want to pray along with you. Maybe I'm even talking to somebody here and you're not sure about your relationship with God. You're not sure that if you died tonight, that you're on your way to heaven. You're not sure that you're a child of God, that your sins are forgiven. But you want to be sure today. Whatever the need is, whatever confession you're struggling with that you want God's help with, I want to pray with you. And just an upraised hand, say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. If you want like that, amen. Yes, I see those hands. Just put it up, put it back down, yes. Amen. And I'll include you in prayer. Any others? Lord knows your heart. I just want to pray with you. Amen. Yes, I see those hands. And Marco, let's stand for that word of prayer. And Heavenly Father, again, we commit the issues of this service into your hands. Lord, you heard the confessions of these, your people. You know the areas in our lives that we struggle in. Lord, we ask that you would help each one to be who you've called them to be. For those that raise their hands, Lord, you know exactly what they stand in need of. Lord, meet that need. Whatever area of deficiency in their faith, in their life, in their witness, Lord, we know that you're more than able to build up in their lives. And so we commit them to you. Lord, we pray that no one would leave this place without the assurance of their salvation. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name.